Matthew chapter 5 is our scripture lesson. I mentioned to you last week I had not been able to get away from the truth of Proverbs 11:11. 11, 11. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. And it's like the Lord kept drawing me back to that. The influence of righteous people and how our righteousness, our life for God, blesses others. That verse says it blesses a city. And I mentioned to you last week that it just dawned on me, and I'm sure that you'd already thought about this, but it just dawned on me the discussion that God had with Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, God says to Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham says, if you can find 50 righteous people there, will you spare the city? And God said, I will. And then Abraham continues to negotiate all the way down to 10 and says, if there are 10 righteous, will you spare the city? And God said, I will. And it hit me that if there had been 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have brought blessing to that city by causing it not to be destroyed. The, the blessing of upright blesses and exalts a city. And we talked about it briefly last week on a global scale, that there's coming a time in this world when all of the righteous people will be gone from it. And as messed up as our world is now, the blessing of the righteous on our world is demonstrated by you starting to read in Revelation chapter 6 what's going to happen after what is called the rapture of the church. It's that passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, where the dead in Christ rise, then we which are alive and remain caught up with them in the, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The rapture of the church where we leave. When we leave, the Holy Spirit leaves, right? Because the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost to infill believers. When we leave, we take the Holy Spirit with us in that dimension, and then literally all hell breaks loose on this earth. You start reading in Revelation 6, 25% of the world's population is destroyed, and then there's pestilence and famine, and there's earthquakes, and people are crying for the rocks to fall on them, and the sun turns black, and the moon turns to blood, and the water supply is contaminated, and all of these things happen. What brought all that on? The righteous people and their blessing left the earth. So even though the world may not acknowledge it, we are a blessing to this earth. The, the fact that we are not experiencing more of God's judgment is due to the fact that there are still righteous people on the earth asking God for mercy, asking God for grace, asking God to, to withhold his judgment. But when those righteous people are gone, chaos ensues. But I want this morning for us to focus more on an individual, personal level. God has us on this earth to be a blessing to other people. And I believe that for many of us, this is the missing element in our lives. We want to live a life of purpose and meaning. We want our lives, regardless of what we do with our lives, we want them to make a difference for somebody. We want to make somebody's life better. We want to make somebody's life easier. We want to be a blessing. But it seems that the vast majority of our lives are taken up by things that are neither meaningful nor purposeful. You know, it just seems that there is no meaning in this. There is no purpose in this. Why am I doing it? And the frustration level rises because we feel that we're not doing what God put us here to do which is to be a blessing to other people. What I hope you will leave here in a few minutes understanding is that there is nothing purposeless or meaningless if you're a believer and you're doing it for the glory of God. That God will use what seems to be insignificant, meaningless things that you're involved with to actually be a blessing to other people. 
And we started last week in Matthew 5 talking about being the salt of the earth. And today we're going to talk about being the light of the world. It's not what we do so much as who we are. He's not talking about our activity in the world. He's talking about our influence in the world. I've been saying this over this last month because I haven't been able to get away from it, that I believe that if we're a believer, when we walk into a room, the atmosphere of the room ought to change. Maybe just slightly, but it ought to change. When we interact with somebody, they should feel better after that interaction than they did before it. I told you about back when I was a smart aleck, and I, I know y'all looked at me like, you never. But you know, the sign I used to have in my office that said everyone brings joy to this room, someone they enter, someone they leave. You know? But we, we want to be one of those people that brings joy when we enter. You know what it's like, you know, when you were on the job or whatever and, and so and so wasn't there and your day went so much better. <laughs> Well, maybe you have been blessed to know some people that when they were there, you knew you were going to have a good day. Because they're positive, they pull their weight, they do their job, they're not in yang, 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 you know, they're, they're positive and encouraging, and you enjoy working with them, and the day goes better when they're there. That's what I'm talking about. Being a positive influence where we are. Just because of who we are. Not because necessarily of what we've said, not necessarily because of the actions that we did, but because of our influence, because we are God's children. And the righteousness of the upright brings exaltation and positive encouragement to those people. People ought to be happy they ran into you. They all said, man, I'm glad I ran into them today. They made me feel good. You know, maybe it was just for a moment. You know, maybe it was just for a couple minutes, but it was just what I needed to make it through the next thing in my day. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, starting in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. We studied that verse last week. Today we come to verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. There was an old Roman saying that there's nothing more useful than sun and salt. And when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, he's talking about some indispensable elements. You know, without salt, food is tasteless. Without light, life is gloomy and depressing. Now, we know that Jesus is the light of the world. John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 1, 4, speaking of Christ, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Verse 9, the true light that gives light to every man. John chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus starts to make a transition and says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But he's not in the world now, right? He's back in heaven. So, how is he in the world today? How is his light shining in the world today through his followers? Since he has gone back to heaven, we are now the light of the world. And through his followers, his light is to continue to shine in this world. His light is to be reflected through us. Just as the moon reflects the light of the sun, we are to reflect the light of Christ. Now, let's talk for just a little bit about what light does. We're the light of the world, right? Well, what are we supposed to do? Light dispels darkness. Most of us don't much like darkness. 
Have you ever been sick in the middle of the night and it just, it, sickness is worse in the middle of the night, right? If I could just get to morning, I think I'll be better. We know what it's like when the power goes out and everything's dark, especially if we didn't have a flashlight close to us. Of course, nowadays, you know, most of the phones have a flashlight on them. You know, <laughs> we had some guests spending a night with us, and I was telling you, oh, there's a night, there's a flashlight on the nightstand, and they looked at me and said, you know, we do have phones, right? He said, oh, okay, you know, because you know, you got your flashlight on your phone now. But, but we know what it's like, and the nice thing about it, as long as your phone's charged, you know, the problem with me and flashlights is I never get around to changing the batteries, and so the flashlight's not much help. But we know that darkness can be depressing, darkness can be oppressive. We can just get to the light. I, I don't believe I could survive, you know, in the parts of the world where it's basically dark for six months out of the year. I just don't think I could handle it. I don't care if it's zero degrees, if the sun's shining, I'm okay. Um, you know, got to have the light. And there are people who live in spiritual and emotional and psychological darkness. And they're living in that oppression and that depression. And they may put on a brave front, but when their guard is down, they can, they'll talk to you about how much pressure they're under and how much darkness they're under. They may not use that term, but that's what they describe. And as the light of the world... Our job is to help get rid of some of that darkness. We may not be able to lift it all, but we can help. Even in situations where we have to deliver news that maybe isn't the news they wanted to hear, we can do it with a way that leaves them with hope and leaves them with some encouragement. And, and, and it's our job to help lift the darkness in people's lives. I realize that my set of information is skewed because of the work I do, you know, outside of the church. Because I deal with death and dying and sickness and struggle, you know, every day. But I have come to understand, even in my, you know, when I'm not at the hospitals or the nursing homes, when I'm out and about and I, I, I talk to the banker or I talk to the server or I talk to somebody behind this counter, every, darkness is prevalent. People are living lives that they're just barely surviving. They're working this job 40 hours a week, and then they're going and working over there 25 or 30 hours a week, and, and they never see their kids, and they rarely see their spouse, and they're just barely hanging on, and then their car blows up, or, you know, and, and, and we need to be light. We need to be just by the influence of Christ in us. A little ray of sunshine, you know, in somebody's life. Life dispels the darkness. Light reveals hindrances. Now you probably have from your bed to the bathroom memorized. You know, you probably know how to get around your house at night. But maybe you used to work second shift or third shift and you came home in the middle of the night and when you had little children you learned that they didn't always put their toys up as you crashed over them trying to be quiet in the middle of the night. Or you stepped on the dog's tail or, you know, or, or something was going on. Or, or your wife moved the furniture while you were gone and where did that chair come from? You know? But if you had just turned on the light, you'd have been able to see the hindrances. And as light, part of what we do is help people see what's going on in their lives from a different perspective. Now, again, we're talking about you know building a relationship with people and them trusting you enough to open up to you, but over time, you will be able to be a source of light to them, not just revealing the hindrances, because that's not enough. Light also shows the way out. <coughs> I don't remember which security company it's for, but some security company is running a series of ads now. The guy goes to the dentist, and the dentist, you know, says, oh man, that's a huge cavity. And the guy says, fix it. He said, oh no, I'm not here to fix it. I'm just here to monitor it. Yeah. 
Well, there's a whole lot of people in the world who are monitors. You know, they can tell you everything you're doing wrong. They can tell you about all the problems in your life, but they don't have a clue how to help you. Light isn't just to reveal the hindrance, it's to show the way out. It's to say, here is how you get out of that mess. And again, you got to ask for permission. You know, don't leave here today and say, well, the preacher told me I was supposed to tell you that the reason you're having a problem. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You know me better than that, I hope. But there comes a time in your building relationships with people where you will be amazed at the opportunities you will have when they say, what in the world am I supposed to do? And you say to them as you breathe a prayer, please help me, Lord. <laughs> you say to them, do you really want some input or do you just want me to listen? And who knows, you may have some experience that you can draw on that will help them see the light out and see the way. Decades ago, <coughs> I was at a preacher's conference <coughs> and the speaker was talking about how when he travels and he's in, you know, strange hotel room, that he, before he turns out the light at night, he paces off the room. They say, so I know it's six steps to this and there's the dresser and I turn right and go four steps and there's the opening into the bathroom and it's six steps and everybody's taking notes. Oh man, that's amazing. And I'm thinking, spend a dollar eighty nine and put a night light in your travel bag. You know, <laughs> who has time to remember to pace off how many paces so you don't run into the dresser. Put on a night light. It'll show you the way. <coughs> and as believers <coughs> Our light, our life, helps people see the way. Light warms. We know about heat lamps. You know, there's something warming. Isn't it wonderful to step outside and feel the warm light of the sun? Of course, we know now it's vitamin D and all that kind of stuff. But all I care about is there's nothing that feels much better than the warm light of the sun. Do you warm up? the environment around you. There's a lot of coldness in this world, isn't there? A lot of people been hurt, a lot of people suspicious, a lot of people just cold. And as the light, we can help warm up the environment around us. Light helps things grow. Now, I don't know this because the only thing I'm good at growing is weeds. But, you know, when Donna has different plants, you know, she, oh, this one needs sun. You know, a lot of plants need the sun if they're going to grow. Light helps things grow. Are you helping people grow? Are you helping people develop in their lives? You know, some people don't have anybody in their life that they can process things with. You know what it's like when you get home from work and you just need to sit down and talk to somebody about go through your day and all the aggravations and the frustrations. What a blessing it is if you can be one of those people that listens to somebody who has no one else to listen to. Sometimes it's aggravating and frustrating, but it's being the light. Your smile. I'm so glad to see you today. You know, try that tomorrow as you see people. I'm so glad I got to see you today. You know, oh, really? People aren't used to people being kind to them. I saw a bumper sticker one time that said, just be nice. <laughs> yeah, just be nice. You know, again, we're not talking about, turns out, oh man, I gotta, gotta turn on the light. No, he just says, you are the light. It's who you are as being plugged into the light source. Let his light shine. Your encouragement gives them hope. Your pat on the back helps them realize they can take another step. Your thank you lets them know that people appreciate what they're doing and that people are recognizing that. Help people grow and develop in their lives. And then light spreads. And you know, he says, let your light shine. You're gonna put it on a candlestick. It's gonna give light to the house. And big lights give light even beyond the house. You are the light of the world. 
So he says, let your light shine. Well, what hinders our light shining? Now we have to remember that we are not the source of the light. We are the reflector of the light. So what causes the light to not shine in our world now is when we are poor reflectors. Christ is the source. We are the reflector. And we are to shine because of our relationship with him. In Acts chapter 6, verse 15, when Stephen is being stoned to death as the first martyr of the church, the Bible says that the people that were watching this Notice that his face was shining while he's being martyred. I have read the New Testament several times. I have never yet found where the church held face-shining seminars. They never held a class on here's how to make your face shine. He probably didn't even know his face was shining. His face was shining because he was reflecting the light of Christ. So I started thinking about some things that mess up reflection. If there's something between us and Christ, we're going to be poor reflectors. If there's something between the source of the light and the reflector of the light, in nature is called an eclipse. And there are times in our lives, if we're not careful, where something will be eclipsing the light of Christ from reflecting off of us. When there's something that has come between us and Christ. Typically, what comes between us and Christ is sin. You know, our disobedience comes between us and Christ, and it causes the reflection to stop. And his light cannot be shown into the world because of our sin. Sometimes it's because we're dirty or distorted, and if you've ever been in front of a mirror that was distorted, you know that the image is then distorted. Have you ever tried to get that line of dirt off your face and then realized it wasn't on your face, it was on the mirror? <laughs> when, when the mirror's distorted, the reflection's distorted. Well, there's a whole lot of distorted ideas about God and Christ and the church in our world today because the world has seen too much distorted reflection. You know those fun houses where they have the mirrors that make you look all kind of weird shapes? I do not appreciate the fact that when I was at work the other day, Donna put one of those mirrors in my bathroom apparently because I look in this mirror and there's this old gray-headed fat guy looking back at me and it's got to be one of those distorted mirrors. I know it has to be. <laughs> but, but we know about distortion. And when the mirror's not right, the reflection's not right. And you're smart enough to know, you know, there's a lot of distorted views of Christ out there because the mirrors that are reflecting are dirty and distorted. And Jesus says they can't see the light if it's under a bowl, under a bushel. Last week we talked about if the salt is going to be effective, it's got to get out of the salt shaker. And the salt shaker is the church building. And if the salt is going to make a difference in the world, it's got to get out into the world. Same is true for the light. The light, you know, for, for us, the bushel or the bowl is the church building. And what we need to do is get out of the church building and start shining our light in the darkness instead of shining our light in the light. What we Christians are good at doing is coming in to the church and being the light of the church. And we talk about our lights and we talk about how to increase the wattage of our bulbs and we, we shine our lights from wall to wall and the darkness never sees the light. He did not say, when you come to church, turn on your light. When you come to church, let everybody see how bright your light shines. He says, no, when you leave the church and get into your car and drive out of the parking lot and get to your neighborhood and your school and your classroom and your factory and your office and wherever it is that you live your life, let your light shine. Because light is not given for light. Light is given for darkness. 
Now, if you came out here one day and it's midday and the sun is shining bright and I've got a flashlight on walking around the parking lot, you'd think I was crazier than you already think I am. Because light is not given for light. Light is given for darkness. And if there was ever a need for the light to shine, it's in the darkness of our world. <laughs> little boy was in a dark room with a flashlight. He was just turning the light off and on, off and on, off and on, off and on. His mom said, what are you doing? He says, I'm punching holes in the darkness. That's what God has put us here to do, to punch holes in the darkness. He has us here to be a blessing to other people. The blessing of the people in your life, the people you run in contact with. It may be just on the phone. You know, I'm on a call center. How can I be the light? Well, we talked to somebody in a call center the other day, and I don't believe that person had ever had a warm feeling in their life. How may I help you? All right, did you try this? Did you try this? Did you try this? Okay, goodbye. Well, wonderful. You know, at least put a little inflection in your voice, you know. Um, and, and I'm not talking about faking it. I mean, we all know the fakers, right? Hey, how are you doing? You know, and, uh, people do not like fake salt. People do not like fake light. I'm not talking about being fake. I'm talking about being such in, so in contact with Christ that his light shines through us. And as the light of the world, it's our job to be punching holes in the darkness of the lives of the people that we deal with every day. <coughs> There's an old fable about a discussion between a cave and the sun. And the sun said to the cave, come up and see my light. And the cave said, no, first come down and see my darkness. And the sun said, okay. And so the sun went into the cave and said to the cave, show me your darkness. But there was no darkness because the sun had come. And our job is to be the sun. Our job is to be the reflector of Christ's light, to bring light into that dark world. And again, you may not be able to dispel all of their darkness, but you can give some hope. You can give some encouragement. You can give a smile. I mean, you study the, the, the data that's out there now on how much better you feel if you just had a good laugh. You know, sometimes just helping somebody laugh gives them the energy they need to make it another step. That's why Christ has us here. That is not insignificant. That is not meaningless. It is not purposeless. It is being the light of Christ in this world. So what does Jesus say will happen? He says, men will see your good deeds. That word good there is a word that means attractive or beautiful or pleasing to the eye. Kind of interesting. He says, they will see the beauty of your life. And in the church I grew up in, there was a little chorus we sang, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. That's what he says. They will see the beauty of your life. They will be drawn to the way you live. They will want to hang around you. They may not have any idea why it is. They may think it's your personality or that you're just sparky or, you know, but it's Christ in you that is drawing them to you. And Jesus says, let your light shine. When they see the light, when they see your life, he doesn't say when they hear a beautifully put together sermon or when they hear a masterful number by the choir or when they sit in your beautiful sanctuaries. He says, when they see your light, when they see your life, when they see how you live, Edgar Guest wrote something called The Living Sermon. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes of better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. The best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action. 
Your tongue too fast may run. The lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. The Living Sermon by Edgar Guess. Men will see your good deeds and give God the credit. But glorify your Father, which is in heaven. He says, your light, your good deeds, your Father in heaven. When your light shines before people, they glorify your Father. It's full circle, because the light came from him. We reflect it. They see, and they glorify God. We point people to Christ. We lead them out of darkness into light. We do the shining, God gets the credit. There's something about light. It does not call attention to itself. The purpose of light is so that you can see other things the way they really are. You ever been in a strain, maybe in a guest room somewhere, or a hotel room, and it's dark, and, and there's this weird-looking shadow on the wall, and it seems to be moving, and this looks weird, and this looks weird, and you turn on the lights, oh, that was just the curtain, the air conditioning was blowing the curtain, and that was just this thing over here. Light helps you see things the way that they really are. When, when people walk into a city at night that's beautifully illuminated, they don't say, oh, look at the lights. They say, man, look at this architecture. Look at this building and look at this beauty. When you sit down under a chandelier for your Thanksgiving dinner, you don't say, oh, what a great chandelier. You say, oh, what a great spread. Because the purpose of light is to show things in the right perspective, the way they really are. And so as our light shines, we help give people perspective. And over time, the darkness starts to fade and they begin to see spiritual truth and God gets the credit. So the question is, how can we shine like that? We'll give you 16 easy steps. No. How do we shine like that? A couple were getting ready to go camping. And they were at one of these camping stores and they saw a, a display of matchboxes, you know, they had the matches in it, but it, it said that this matchbox glows in the dark so that you can see it at night to find your matches. And so they went out and it's dark and they decide they're going to look for their matchbox that glows in the dark and it wasn't glowing in the dark and they couldn't find it. So they turned on the flashlight and found the matchbox and looked at the instructions on the matchbox and it said, if you want me to shine in the night, keep me in the light. Ah, that's the way it works, isn't it? If you want me to shine in the night, keep me in the light. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, We all with an open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image, from glory to glory, by the Spirit of the Lord. See, the light comes from the face of Christ. And as we focus on Him, as we spend time in His presence, as we read His Word, as we worship Him, as we look into His face, we are changed into that same glory. As we stay in His light, His light will shine through us. It's not 16 easy steps. It's just stay in the light. <laughs> stay connected to Christ. This, we said this last week. This is be who you are. It's not something you turn on and off. It's who you are because you've been in the presence of Christ. And when you stay connected to Him, He shines through you. And the people you come in contact with are glad you came in contact with them because you gave them a moment or two or a few minutes of, of joy or peace or encouragement or hope or a smile. And, and you help lift their burden and you help give them some perspective and you help them see some light in the midst of their darkness. Don't ever underestimate the power of being the light. Let your light shine. 
Stay connected to Christ. Stay in tune with Him. And He will, because it's what He does, He will shine through you. And touch the lives of those in your life. Father, help us be who we are. Help us to stay connected to you. Help us to stay in your presence so that your light can shine through us. Lord, there are so many hurting people in our world. Some of them put on a good front, but they're hurting. And they wonder if anybody cares. They wonder if anybody sees the work they do. They wonder if anybody sees the burdens they carry. May we be their light. May you flow through us to touch them with encouragement, with hope, with strength, with peace, with a moment of joy, so that their burdens can be lifted. And ultimately, Lord, so that we would have the privilege of pointing them to the source of that light, which is you. May we be your light in this darkness. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming out today. You're dismissed.